The pinnacle of success in any mixed martial arts promotion is the coveted position of world champion, king amongst men, ruler of the division and most dangerous fighter on the planet. But to even get a shot at a world title is no easy task. It can sometimes take a lifetime of hard work and dedication and even then so many fighters fall short. Look back through the history books, however, and you can find examples of fighters who have performed to the level required in order to secure championship gold, and either through bad luck or by competing in opposing organizations, weren't gifted the title of undisputed champion. Today we are taking a look at these individuals, the moments in their careers where gold could have realistically been awarded and where they fell short. I'm Balian from MMA On Point, and here are 10 fighters who realistically should have been champion. Number 10. Pat Militich's Losses One of the earliest pioneers and general all-round mixed martial artists, Pat Militich lost only once in his first 24 MMA bouts and went on to become the first ever UFC welterweight champion at UFC 17.5. Aside from going on to start his own training camp and regime, Militich Fighting Systems, Pat wasn't content to remain in the UFC, even while champion, and began competing outside of the promotion in events such as World Extreme Fighting, Cage Combat, and Rings Japan. It was outside of the UFC, though, he seemed to face his toughest challenges, as less than four months after picking up the UFC belt, he lost via triangle choke to Hotaro Nakao at Super Brawl 11. Yes, that's right, I'm implying Nakao could have been UFC champion. I mean, after all, he did beat the undisputed belt holder, and that does kind of break down the idea of what a champion is supposed to be the best. Militic would jump back to the UFC five months later to successfully defend his title, only to head to World Extreme Fighting where he would lose again to Jose Landy Johns. This pattern continued for Pat and any of his victorious opponents could have realistically been a UFC champion if only those bouts had taken place in the appropriate promotion. Number 9. Ensign Inoue American hero and mixed martial arts Mount Rushmore figurehead Randy Couture burst onto the scene at UFC 13 in 1997, making his professional MMA debut. He blasted through his two opponents that night, went on to beat rising phenom Vitor Belfort five months later, and was thrust into a title shot at UFC 15.5, which he won, beating Marie Smith, becoming the UFC heavyweight champion and looking damn impressive while doing so, all within the space of one year, going from an unknown fighter making his pro debut to the best in the world. Everyone was on the Randy Couture hype train, waving the American flag and screaming, just bleed. His next fight, however, would be outside of the UFC in a lesser known promotion, Valet Tudo Japan, where he would face Ensign Inoue, a rising star with more experience than the UFC champion. After a heated back and forth, Inoue tapped Couture in less than two minutes via armbar and went on to celebrate in earnest, even bringing his dog into the ring. And why wouldn't he? After all, he just beat the UFC heavyweight champion, supposedly the baddest man on the planet. But of course, as it was outside the UFC, he wasn't awarded the title. But as you can guess by the theme of today, this victory over the current champion could have secured the strap. Number 8. Holly Holm Again, I began this list discussing just how treacherous and difficult the road to UFC gold can be. But if you're Holly Holm, it's an all-familiar path, as she has had no less than four opportunities, capturing it only once with a famous head kick KO of Ronda Rousey. So, in the wake of the UFC's announcement that a new women's featherweight division would be created, Holly Holm was matched up against Dutch kickboxing veteran Jermaine Durandamy for the vacant 145-pound title. In what would be a highly contested bout, Durandamy would land not one but two late and, of course, illegal blows at the end of both the second and third rounds. Not only did these shots clearly hurt Holly, who went on to say, those were the hardest shots I felt the entire fight, but the ref did absolutely nothing about it. So when the scorecards were read out and Durandamine edged the victory by only one point, there was uproar across the MMA community. Most believe one, if not two points should have been taken for the damaging illegal punches, and if that had been the case, we would be looking at a different women's featherweight champion. Number 7. Dwayne Ludwig what is quite possibly the deepest and most popular division in the UFC, 155 pounds, had a turbulent start in the promotion. Initially, they had a lightweight division, but no title and no title fights. That didn't stop Jens Pulver from picking up three wins at UFC 24, 26, and 28 before it was decided that a lightweight belt would be created and he was matched up against UFC newcomer Carl Uno at UFC 30. 
Jen secured a decision win and was crowned the first ever 155 pound champion. He even went on to defend the belt twice, besting Dennis Hallman as well as beating back the prodigy BJ Penn. However, after the UFC declined a requested pay rise, Pulver promptly left the organization as the reigning champion. Six months later, and he was competing in the Canadian TKO promotion against fellow lightweight Dwayne Ludwig. The man they call Bang certainly lived up to his nickname as he KO'd Pulver inside two minutes and booked himself a ticket into the UFC. However, having defeated the lightweight champion outside of the UFC, of course the title hadn't been on the line, but at the time Pulver was undisputedly the best 155 around and had Ludwig already been in the promotion, he would have been crowned champion. Number 6. Chael Sonnen there are many accolades you could attribute to the American gangster Chael Sonnen, biggest arms in MMA, purchaser of Soldier of Fortune magazine, and non-conformist to the art of jiu-jitsu and laying underneath another man. However, one thing you can't attribute is the title of MMA champion. His first shot came against Paulo Filo at WEC 31, where he was controversially submitted with five seconds left in the second round. Chael, being the gangster he is, had refused to tap and instead cried out in pain, forcing the ref to stop the contest. So, after he protested heavily, a rematch was scheduled, but unfortunately, Filo missed weight, coming in seven pounds over the limit, and so the bout was declared a non-title fight. Chael went on to win via unanimous decision, and Filo told press he would mail Son in the belt, but before anything else could be decided the WEC's middleweight division was dissolved in light of its acquisition by the UFC and Chael never got his championship belt. Still, as we all know, it doesn't matter if you're the best fighter in the world with a title belt, they won't call you a great fighter, they'll still call you Chael Sonnen. Number 5. John Jones's Opponents Few fighters have achieved the dominance and championship reign that is acquitted to John Jones, successfully defending his 205 pound title 11 times. Towards the tail end of Jones's 205 reign, the assurances around his victories started to wear a little thin, however. The first man who could have realistically been the 205 champion was Anthony Smith when he was hit with an illegal knee by Jones in the fourth round of their title fight. Being a complete savage, however, Smith opted to continue the contest and ultimately lost a decision. But being well within his rights, he could of course simply have forced a DQ and strapped on the belt. Not looking at you, Aljo. One year later and Jones emerged the winner over an extremely close and controversial decision against challenger Dominic Reyes. Not his first one, mind you, but the stats have Reyes landing more strikes throughout rounds 1, 2 and 3, as well as landing more across the entirety of the bout, with Jones only scoring takedowns in rounds 4 and 5. Even Dana White thought Reyes won and stated, my kids are terrorizing me, asking, how can this happen, dad? Reyes won that fight. Well, Far be it from a group of MMA judges to disagree with the spawn of Dana White, but I and much of the MMA world think that the kids were right on this one, and by all rights, Reyes coulda, woulda, shoulda been the UFC champion. Number 4. Marcus Aurelio at one time, pride fighting championships were quite possibly the greatest show on earth. The crowd, the spectacle, and the fights themselves were all spectacular, but the league and the way they handled matchmaking wasn't always as cut and dry as the UFC. After winning the only ever pride lightweight Grand Prix in 2005, the fireball kid Takanori Gomi was crowned the pride lightweight champion, having demonstrated his baseball pitch-like punches and sprawl and brawl style to its fullest extent. However, pride being pride meant that if the promotion changed, Choose to, they could schedule any of Gomi's next bouts as non-title fights. I mean, why risk your champion against an unknown fighter, right? Promotional genius, if you ask me. Well, that's exactly what they did, and Gomi was matched up against rising Brazilian star Marcus Aurelio. The bout started slowly on the feet until Aurelio powered through a double leg takedown, worked for an arm triangle, and choked the lightweight champion completely unconscious. But of course, this was a non-title fight, so Aurelio was not the new champion, and as such, there would be a rematch for the actual belt, which of course Gomi won. So it was no dice and no strap for Aurelio. Imagine beating the champion and not winning the belt. Oh, only in pride, people. Number 3. Yoel Romero Certain fighters radiate a certain aura, a mystique, each and every time they step into the cage. And aside from the ridiculously shredded body that Yoel Romero walks around on, he's also one of the scariest men to find yourself standing across from in the octagon. But there's another man in the UFC who treats fighting monstrous men with the composure of an Aussie blokey calmly sipping his schooner with his sunnies on. The man they call the Reaper, Robert Whittaker, who was content to fight Yoel Romero not once, but twice. Their first matchup being very close went by the way of the Reaper scoring three rounds to two. 
but he got injured. So Yoel secured an interim title fight against Luke Rockhold, proceeded to KO him stiff, and should have secured gold. But unfortunately, he missed weight prior to the bout, so forfeited his claim to the strap. So the rematch began, and Whittaker and Romero went to war in a fight of the night, ending in a controversially close split decision. Romero had dropped the champion multiple times, and in many fans' eyes, had done enough to secure a 10-8 round, despite not being awarded any by the judges. Whittaker got the decision in a bout that many had considered Romero to be the victor, but he also missed weight for that one, so yeah. Number 2. Kazuo Misaki so back to pride for this one. Are you sensing a pattern yet? It's 2005 and the fabled Dan Henderson has just won the pride welterweight title. After battling through one Grand Prix, he moved on to another, competing in the 2006 welterweight tournament but lost in the second round to Kazuo Misaki. But of course, it being pride and it being a tournament, the belt was not on the line. Kazuo would go on to lose in the semi-finals to Paulo Filo, but Filo injured his knee and so Misaki moved on to the finals instead and won the whole Grand Prix, but wasn't crowned champion because he had already lost or because it's just pride and they did what they wanted. Anyway, Henderson remained the welterweight champion and Misaki never took home a belt. Henderson then went on to beat Vanderlei Silva at Pride 33 and become the first ever champ champ in MMA history, holding both belts at the same time, even though he did technically lose to Misaki, who probably should have been champion. Number 1. Ricardo Arona and you guessed it, we are once again back in Pride Fighting Championships for our final entry. If you hadn't worked out by now, Pride essentially did whatever they wanted with their champions, and they only defended their belts when it was deemed necessary by the promotion itself. There were in fact only two middleweight champions in Pride history, the first being the axe murderer Vanderlei Silva. Silva amassed a 22-1 and record in Pride alone, losing only in an openweight contest against Mark Hunt, before he ran into our final entry on this list, Ricardo Arona. Both men entered the 2005 middleweight Grand Prix and met in the semi-finals. Of course, Vandalay being the champion at the time was favorite to win, but ended up losing the decision. So the fight's at middleweight. You beat the middleweight champion. You get the belt, right? Wrong. As it was a tournament, the belt was not yet on the line, and even the eventual winner of the Grand Prix, Shogun Hua, wasn't granted the middleweight title. Why? Don't ask me. I could speculate, but it was pride, baby. Arona and Vandalay ran it back four months later. This time the title was on the line, but the axe murderer scraped an extremely close decision, and once again a pride champion retained his title, despite having lost whilst being the champion. Honestly, I can't even be mad at the system. It helped them build their biggest talent and organize the biggest fights possible for their title bouts. We asked Dana White his opinion on these particular pride practices. You know what he said? That's fucking illegal. A big shout out to Luke Taylor for editing this video. You can find him and some of his amazing artwork on Twitter at cool to me underscore. Shout out to Ben Rosette and the excellent music he provided during the intro video. His music can be found on streaming platforms everywhere. There is a link in the description and follow him at Ben Rosette on Instagram and on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching everyone today. Please go ahead and like and subscribe if you did enjoy the content. We upload at least three videos every week for your viewing pleasure. Go ahead and leave a comment below if you want to join in the discussion and follow us on Twitter at MMA on Point and myself at Balian underscore plays. You can now jump in and join the community discord as well if you want to continue the discussion further and I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I'll see you in the next one.